Following the Battle of Kernstown on March 23, 1862, Confederate Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson retreats with his Valley District to Mount Jackson, further down the Shenandoah Valley. Union Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, with his Department of the Shenandoah reinforced significantly, pursues Jackson deeper into the valley, determined to destroy his forces in another pitched battle. By mid-April, with mounting pressure from Banks' approaching army, Jackson continues his withdrawal through the Middle Valley region. He soon establishes his camps at Swift Run Gap in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Meanwhile, Banks moves south to Harrisonburg, where he will remain until early May. Stonewall Jackson's challenge now is to hold the entire Shenandoah Valley for the Confederacy. He must carry out his given task to prevent Union Army forces then stationed in the valley and in Western Virginia from moving east to support Major General George B. McClellan's campaign against Richmond. Of the immediate concern to Jackson is the possibility that Banks will link up with troops in the newly created Mountain Department commanded by Major General John C. Fremont. The vanguard of Fremont's command, Brigadier General Robert H. Milroy's brigade, is already pushing east towards Stanton, an important rail and supply center for the Confederacy. On April 29th, Jackson telegraphs General Robert E. Lee, military advisor to Confederate President Jefferson Davis in Richmond, laying out three different plans for dealing with the Union threat. Unite with Brigadier General Edward Allegheny Johnson's command, known as the Army of the Northwest, located west of Stanton, and strike Milroy. Join forces with Major General Richard Stoddart Ewell's division, over 8,000 strong and already moving towards the valley from the Rappahannock River around Culpeper to reinforce Jackson, and head north in the valley, taking on Banks' Federals, or link up with Ewell and move up the eastern side of the Blue Ridge Mountains threatening General Banks' line of communication. General Lee allows the final decision to fall upon Jackson as to which plan to adopt, and Jackson chooses the first, unite with Allegheny Johnson, and move against Milroy. The next day, April 30th, as Ewell's division is approaching Swift Run Gap, Jackson leads his command south, then east, across the Blue Ridge, to Meckham Station, a stop on the Virginia Central Railroad and not too far from Charlottesville, Virginia. To Major General Banks, this shows that Jackson is leaving the Shenandoah Valley, and the Union General reports it as such to Washington, D.C. But Jackson's move is a clever ruse. Once at Meckham's, the bulk of Jackson's force boards railroad cars and returns to Stanton in the valley. Part of Jackson's command has to march, but by May 5th, Jackson has all his troops in Stanton. Believing Major General Jackson to be gone from the Shenandoah Valley, the authorities in Washington orders Banks to withdraw down the valley to Strasburg and to send the division commanded by Brigadier General James Shields back east. On May 7th, Jackson, now numbering some 11,600 after joining forces with Johnson, starts moving west on the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike. As Jackson's columns marches, there is some skirmishing with Milroy's outpost. But in the late morning of May 8th, Jackson reaches the outskirts of McDowell. Around noon, Jackson, Johnson, Jedediah Hotchkiss, Jackson's cartographer, who has surveyed much of the valley and provided Stonewall with an excellently drawn maps of the region and a small number of Confederate infantry, scales Sitlinton's Hill, an elevation that rises nearly 600 feet above the level plain below and dominates the immediate area while reconnoitering Milroy's camps in and around McDowell a mile distant, Stonewall Jackson determines that he will attack the Federals the next day, but Milroy beats him to the punch. Milroy convinces Brigadier General Robert Schink, whose brigade arrives at mid-morning, with Schink's men, Milroy could count perhaps 4,500 troops, that the best defense is a spoiling attack. Attack the Confederates, catching them off guard, then retreat after dark. Milroy is also concerned with the reports that Confederate artillery is being positioned on Sitlinton's Hill. From there, enemy cannon could easily hit the Federal camps in McDowell. At 4.30 p.m. on May 8, 1862, the Battle of McDowell, also known as the Battle of Sitlinton's Hill, begins when five Union regiments, some 2,500 infantry supported by artillery, 
move out from McDowell to attack the Confederates posted on Sittlington's Hill. They cross the Bull Pasture River and begin marching up Sittlington's Hill in brigade line of battle. The job is not an easy one to carry out. Colonel Nathaniel C. McLean, commander of the 75th Ohio and in charge of the federal attack, remember that the side of the mountain up which I was compelled to attack was entirely destitute of protection, either from trees or rocks, and so steep that the men were at times compelled to march either to one side or the other in order to make the assault. For many Union and Confederate soldiers at McDowell, this is their first introduction to battle, and probably would have echoed Colonel George H. Smith of the 25th Virginia Infantry, who writes afterwards that this was my first fight, and I hardly knew what to do. Despite the lack of experience, the Battle of McDowell sees intense combat, starting before 6 p.m. and lasting well after dark. One participant recalled that the sheets of flame shot from the angry mouths of the guns, lighting up the whole side. Although the Confederates are defending, they actually suffer higher casualties. This is primarily due to several factors. For one, the sun sets in the west, behind the Union lines, and so the Confederates are silhouetted against the clear sky to the east. Next, because Confederates stand above their Union foe, they tend to overshoot. And finally, most of the Federal infantry are armed with rifled muskets, while many Confederates are still armed with smoothbores. One Confederate regiment, the 12th Georgia Infantry, takes especially high casualties. During the action on Sittlington's Hill, the 12th Georgia takes position on the left center of the Confederate line on top of the hill. There they occupy a ridge spur that requires the regiment to form like an inverted V. This position, exposed to the enemy from three sides, is one reason the Georgians suffer high such casualties, but there are other reasons. The 12th Georgia's ranks are using 69 caliber smoothbore guns, mainly outdated Mexican War era Springfield model 1842 muskets, whose effective range is little more than 100 yards, about as far away as the Federals stand, while their opponents, the 75th Ohio, are using rifled muskets such as the newly developed Springfield model 1861, with much greater range and accuracy using ammunition in the form of the Manebals. Also, as evening falls over the battlefield, the Georgians find themselves silhouetted against a clear sky to the east, making them find targets. Finally, as losses mount, the 12th Georgia's officers order their men to pull back to a less exposed position. The men refuse, and the next day, one member of the regiment explains that, we did not come all the way to Virginia to run before the Yankees. Their bravery cost them dearly. Entering the battle with 540 in the ranks, the 12th Georgia sees 52 killed, 123 wounded, a loss of nearly 35%. Action along the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike also sees the Union 3rd West Virginia face skirmishers from the 31st Virginia. Some members from both regiments have been recruited in Clarksburg, where Stonewall Jackson was born. So while exchanging volleys, they also call off their former neighbors by name. The fighting continues after dark, but close to 9 p.m., as Union soldiers begin to run low on ammunition, General Milroy orders his men to withdraw. They pull back into McDowell, bringing as many of their wounded with them as they can. And before 2 a.m. on May 9th, the Federals begin a retreat to Franklin, Virginia. Jackson moves into the village of McDowell the next morning, assigning to the Virginia Military Institute cadets, who were present at the battle but had not taken part in the fighting the unpleasant task of burying the dead and dealing with the wounded. Union casualties at McDowell numbered 256, while the Confederates suffer 532. Of that number, the 12th Georgia Infantry alone loses 175 men. On the next morning of May 9th, Jackson sends news to Richmond, writing, God bless our arms with victory at McDowell yesterday. This victory is received with great jubilation for the Confederacy has experienced numerous setbacks that spring, a Union blockade that is starting to take effect, the loss of Island No. 10 in New Orleans along the Mississippi River, the defeat of Shiloh, and McClellan's Army of the Potomac itching its way up towards Richmond. 
Jackson's victory at McDowell does much to raise Southern morale. It also stops the Federal advance into the upper Shenandoah Valley and to Stanton. The next day, May 10th, Jackson begins his pursuit of the Union forces, following them to Franklin. Satisfied that they had been dealt with for the time being, Jackson turns back to McDowell and then to Stanton. Now, Jackson can turn his attention to Major General Banks, and that is exactly what he would do.